In this video we'll examine coulomb damping, which is a type of mechanical damping in which energy is absorbed via sliding friction, and this arises any time you have two surfaces in contact which start sliding relative to one another. In many mechanical systems, coulomb or dry friction dampers are used because of their mechanical simplicity and convenience, and also in vibrating structures, whenever the components slide relative to each other, dry friction damping appears internally, and this might arise, say, when the joints are bolted together instead of welded together, which allows a little bit of relative movement. For the purpose of this analysis, we will return to the simple harmonic oscillator, which is just a mass spring setter, only instead of riding along a frictionless surface like it did before. We'll now add the effects of friction, and we will denote the coefficient of kinetic friction mu sub k. Obviously, gravity will also be present in this problem, since without gravity, there would be no frictional contact between the surfaces. The coordinate system x denotes the displacement of the mass to the right, the coordinate x will be used to locate the mass relative to its equilibrium position, and it's defined as positive to the right. The frictional force will be denoted F sub F, and according to Coulomb's law can be written as mu sub k times the normal force, where the normal force is very simply just the weight, in this case mg. So the frictional force is mu sub k mg, and that's just a constant. And I want to just plant this flag here to say, I'm going to refer to it throughout this problem as F sub F because it's just shorthand. A lot of the literature will refer to it as mu mg. I don't really see the point. I don't think it adds much and it just causes clutter. It's probably also worth mentioning at this point that the reason that Coulomb damping is often referred to as constant damping is because the magnitude of the force is just this constant mu sub k mg. And it doesn't depend on the coordinates or on the velocity. We proceed, as always, by looking at the free body diagram, and in this case we need to consider two different cases. The one is when the block is moving to the right, and the other is when it's moving to the left. When it's moving to the right, we say that the velocity x dot is greater than zero, so this is the case the block's moving to the right from its equilibrium position. We have a force kx, which is the typical spring force in the opposite direction, and also the frictional force, which always opposes the motion, is to the left in the case that the block is moving to the right. When the block starts moving to the left, assuming it's still displaced in the positive direction, we have a spring force that still is applied to the left, but the frictional force is now applied to the right since the block is moving left. So we need to consider each of these two cases separately. Case one, where the block is moving to the right, we apply Newton's second law, and we say that mx double dot is equal to the sum of the forces, which is minus kx minus f sub f, because both forces point in the negative x direction. And I can rearrange that to say that mx double dot plus kx equals minus f sub f. And this will look very similar to the simple harmonic oscillator if you cast your mind back. Uh, a link to it appears above if you want to refresh yourself. Um, and this just looks like an external force being applied to it, which is, if you remember the video we did on the gravitational effect, is not altogether different from that. The difference comes in when considering the second case. And the reason for that difference we'll see in just a minute. When considering case two now, the case in which the block is moving to the left, we write Newton's second law again, which looks very similar to the first case, except for a sign change on the F sub F term. F sub F is now being applied in the positive X direction, so it has a positive sign. Again, rearranging that, that looks just like uh, the first equation, we'll call this equation two, and the only difference is the sign change. And this is, in essence, the difference between this problem and the problem I referred to with the gravitational effects, and that is that the external load is changing direction depending on the direction of motion. Now, in some texts, you might see these equations combined into one equation with the use of something called the signum function, and the signum function is defined as whatever the sign of the parameter is, that's what it returns. More about that in a second. So we can then write the equation of motion as mx double dot plus the signum of x dot, which is really just the sign on the x dot term, times f sub f plus kx equals zero. And by writing it that way, it really draws attention to the fact that this term is a quasi-damping term. 
I don't particularly like to look at it like that, but in case that comes up in other texts that you're looking at, you'll know what that's about. The signum function, written SGN of y in this case, is defined as minus 1 when y is less than 0, it's 0 when y is equal to 0, and it's equal to plus 1 when y is greater than 0. So fundamentally what it does is it picks off the sign on a parameter inside. And again, that's called the signum function. So turning the page, the first thing I want to do is copy equations 1 and 2 from the previous page. mx double dot plus kx equals negative f sub f. That was equation 1, and that's when it's block the block is moving to the right. And mx double dot plus kx equals f sub f. That's equation 2, and that's for when the block is moving to the left. Now, looking at equation 1, the response of equation 1 can be written as a combination of the homogeneous response and the particular response, and that can be written as C1 times sine omega nt plus C2 cosine omega nt, that's the homogeneous response, minus f sub f over k. And that comes from the particular response. I don't really want to get into that now, but that's using the method of undetermined coefficients. There's a link right above you. If you want to click on that to refresh yourself, go ahead. But fundamentally, this is uh, just a case of a constant. And if you want to go back and look at that gravitational effects video, we, we treated it there too. So that's the case of the block moving to the right. And similarly, when the block is moving to the left, x sub t, and we use different constants, equals c3 times sine omega nt plus c4 cosine omega nt. Again, that's that same transient or homogeneous response. And only this time, the particular part of the solution has a positive sign in front of it. Okay, so I've gone through this pretty quickly up to this point, uh, but this should all be review for you based on the other videos that I've put out. If any of it is confusing, I suggest you go back and watch some of the previous videos in this series. But here is where the magic starts to unfold. Something worth noting here is the fact that in equation 3, we're consistently subtracting this constant amount, f sub f over k, from the value of x. Well, what is f sub f over k? That could be thought of as the deflection in the spring due to the frictional force. And what we're doing by subtracting it is we're, in effect, shifting the equilibrium position to the right. Uh, so when the mass is moving to the right, the effect of friction is to shift the equilibrium point to the right. And when it's moving to the left, similarly, we're adding this amount. So we're shifting the equilibrium point to the left by doing that. Now, of course, as mentioned before, we can solve this problem numerically, but we can also get some analytical solutions out of it if we consider each part of the cycle piecewise. So to come up with the solution, we first consider the first half cycle, whereby we displace the block by an amount x sub zero to the right, and we let it go. So initially, the block is moving to the left. Let me draw a picture of what I'm talking about. We'll call the first peak here x sub zero. Whoops, let me change my pen. The first peak here x sub zero. The first trough, the amplitude is x1, so this is at a position negative x1. And then at the end of the first cycle, we'll call that peak x2. All right, so our initial conditions, we have at time equals zero, we have the displacement x at zero is equal to x sub zero, and the velocity at zero is equal to zero. We'll call these equation five and equation six. Substituting equation five and six into equation four gives us that x at time zero is equal to c4 plus f sub f over k. The sine part cancels out at time zero, and the cosine part becomes one, and that is equal to x sub zero, the initial displacement. Solving for C4, we find that C4 is equal to x sub zero minus f sub f divided by k. We'll call that equation seven, put a box around it for later, and then substituting the second initial condition for velocity, equation six into equation four, we find that the velocity at time zero, which is just Differentiating equation 4, we get omega sub n c3. When we plug in the value of 0, the sines become 0, the cosines become 1, and we're left with omega n c3 is equal to 0, which implies that c3 is equal to 0. We'll call that equation 8. And now all that remains is to plug equations 7 and 8 back into equation 4, and we get the response for, for the first half cycle. So x of t can be written as x sub 0 minus f sub f divided by k times cosine omega nt plus f sub f divided by k. We'll call this equation 9. 
All right, let's turn the page. So copying equation 9 from the previous page, we can now use this to find the amplitude x1 at the end of the first half cycle. We use the condition that at time equals pi divided by omega n, the position x is equal to minus x1, where x1 is the amplitude. Substituting this condition into equation 9 gives us that negative x1 is equal to x0 minus f sub f over k times cosine of pi plus f sub f over k, and that is equal to minus x sub 0 plus 2 f sub f divided by k. This implies that x1 is equal to x sub 0 minus 2 f sub f divided by k. That's a very useful result. We'll call that equation 10. So if we examine equation 10 a little more closely, what it's telling us is that when we let this mass go from a position x sub 0 initially, by the time it's shifted all the way to the left, it ends up at a position of uh, at negative x1 where the magnitude, the amplitude I should say, x1, is equal to the initial amplitude x0 minus 2 times this amount. I already talked about this amount being, you could think of it as the amount that the frictional force is dis displacing the spring. So there's some sort of a deflection in the spring as a result of the frictional force, and whatever that displacement is, we're losing two times that in the first half cycle. So for the second half of the cycle, we proceed in a similar manner for the first half. And just a reminder that we're now looking at time is greater than pi divided by omega n and less than 2 pi, less than equal to 2 pi divided by omega n. And we treat it the same way as before. At time equals 0, we say the initial position is now negative x1. Remember, x1 is the amplitude and negative is because it's displaced to the left. And the velocity again is 0. And it should be no surprise to find that similar to equation 10, what we arrive at is x, x2 is equal to x1 minus 2 f sub f over k. In other words, the same way as we le released it from position x0 to begin with, and we got to position x1, which was a difference of 2 f sub f over k, which we said was 2 times the deflection in the spring due to the, the frictional force. Same way as the amplitude decreased by this amount going from x0 to x1, we saw it decreased again by the same amount going from x1 to x2, and that should hardly be surprising. We'll call this equation 11, and substituting equation 10 into equation 11 gives us that um, x2 is equal to x sub 0 minus 4 f sub f divided by k. In other words, in one complete cycle, the reduction in the amplitude is an amount of 4 f sub f over k, or four times that theoretical displacement in the spring due to the frictional force. We'll call this equation, two, equation 12 and save it for later. Put a box around it. So we now have all the pieces we need to be able to start making some sense of this. Let's have a look at the response curve of the simple harmonic oscillator with Coulomb damping. And what should be immediately apparent to you is the fact that the peaks are reducing linearly. Okay, that's something that is very different from the case of viscous damping when we had exponential decay of the peaks. And we see that these peaks here are all drawn by, joined by a straight line. All right, let's start putting some labels on this diagram. First of all, the amplitudes that we saw before. X0 is the amplitude of the first peak. The amplitude of the first trough we called F x1. And remember, it's in a negative position, so negative x1. And then x2 is the peak, the second peak. What we showed is that x1 is equal to the previous peak x0, less this amount 2 f sub f over k. And similarly, we found that the second peak was a reduction from the initial peak of 4 f sub f over k. What you should also notice is that at some point, the mass sticks and it doesn't slide anymore. This displacement here is actually f sub f over k. Okay, that is the so-called displacement in the spring due to the frictional force. And we notice that when the displacement falls inside of that, the mass actually sticks. It doesn't come back to its equilibrium position because uh, at some point what happens is the spring, there's not, not enough energy in the system really to overcome the frictional force and the frictional force holds the block in place. Potentially of interest is also to learn the slope of this curve, and that's easy enough. We can see that over a distance in the x direction of 2 pi over omega n, 
we find that it decreases by an amount 4 times f sub f over k. So just dividing the rise divided by the run, we find that the slope of this is negative 2 f sub f omega n over k pi. And I think that pretty much covers the basics of Coulomb damping. I think in ending this, I'd like to just summarize the differences between Coulomb and viscous damping. So on the left we have Coulomb damping, and on the right in red we have viscous damping. In the case of Coulomb damping, the equations of motion are nonlinear, and this has to do with the fact that the frictional force flips signs. In the case of viscous damping, of course, the equations of motion are linear. In the case of Coulomb damping, the amplitudes reduce linearly, while in the case of viscous damping, they reduce exponentially. Another difference is the final rest position generally is displaced from the equilibrium position in the case of Coulomb damping, while in the case of viscous damping, the system comes to rest at the equilibrium position. Coulomb damping, the motion is always periodic, whereas in viscous damping, in the case of an overdamped system, it can just be an exponential decay. It might not be periodic at all. And then finally, in the case of Coulomb damping, the vibrational frequency remains unchanged as a result of the damping. That is significant difference, because in the case of viscous damping, of course, the damping reduces the vibrational frequency. And so there you have it. I realize I've thrown a lot of information at you pretty quickly, but it's all there in video, and I think in ending I'd just like to summarize exactly what it is that we've done from the beginning and go through it very quickly. We decided that with Coulomb damping we needed to treat the cases separately for when the block was moving to the left and moving to the right, and we found that the Coulomb damping effect actually came into the equation of motion as a force, as I change my pen here, uh, came in here as a force rather than as a damping like in the case of viscous damping. We found that we could get analytical solutions by treating each cycle half a cycle at a time and treating each one of those half cycles as an initial value problem. We went through the process of substituting initial conditions for the first half cycle and then similarly for the second half cycle. We then showed what a response curve looks like and the significance of each of these cycles. Mentioned the fact that the peaks decay linearly, differently from the case of viscous damping where they decay ex exponentially. And we found that in each successive peak, the amount of decay was this minus 4f sub f over k. And there you have it. Well, that's about all I have to say on this topic for now. If you have any questions, please use the comment section below. I hope you found something of interest in this video. If you have, please give it a thumbs up so others can get to see it too. Or better still, subscribe to the channel so you'll be notified of all new videos. Thank you for watching this video and I'll catch up with you in the next one.